Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Watley, Chief Program Officer at Street Law, and welcome to our virtual kickoff for the 2021 Legal Diversity Pipeline Program. In the next hour, we're going to be telling you a little bit about what the program is going to look like this year. Uh, for those of you who are new to it, you'll learn about the program overall, as well as some other things about street law. But first, I'm going to share my screen and uh, get us started on some, some housekeeping functions and some ways that you can interact with us during this, this session. So first, we'd love to know who you are. So please take a second, go to the chat function and just introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from. We know that we've had a number of people that have registered for this session uh, from all over the US, including a few other countries. And I know we've had some educators, certainly a lot of people in the legal profession. So again, we'd love to know who's here. I see some people are doing that already. Uh, looks like it. everyone is sending it to just the panelists. Make sure that you're sending it to both panelists and attendees. Great. Thanks, Ben. So you'll see there are a couple of options. If you send it to panelists, then the only people who are going to see that really are Ben, Joy, Erica, and myself. Uh, but we'd love you to send that to panelists and participants so everyone else can know who's on as well. Also, if during this session you have any technical questions, um, any problems with the polls or some of the other functions, please send that, use the chat box to send that to panelists and uh, Ben, who you've already heard, can help you out with that. Uh, but if you have questions for the speakers, please send that to panelists and participants so that we can all see that. During the session, there'll be, there'll be a few times when we use polls. Uh, those polls are anonymous. We don't know who's saying what. And then also at the end of the session, uh, a couple of days later, we will be sending you a recording as well as all of these slides. So uh, if you are rapidly taking notes, you can put that away and really focus and participate in the session. And I see a lot of a lot of chats going on. So great, people are participating. So another question. Um, Please in the chat also just tell us how you're connected with street law. I know that we have some people that have been connected with street law for a long time. Maybe some folks who are new to pipeline or new to some of our other programs. Again, we just love to know who's on and, uh, and who's here today. So I wanna say just a little bit about the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program overall. You know, the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program is uh, it's a partnership between Street Law, NALP, the Association of Corporate Counsel, a number of different uh, firms and leading corporations, and of course, schools and educators. And the goal for the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program is to increase diversity in the legal profession by really sparking an interest in potentially going into the law when people are still in high school. NALP did a study a couple of years ago and showed that a lot of times youth make that decision about whether they want to go to law school as early as high school, in particular youth of color. So this program is a way to really spark that interest at a young age, particularly among some people that may not be thinking about that, may not be thinking about that as a way forward for them. Now, in a normal year, this program would be something that's done face to face through uh, legal professions going into classrooms, uh, guiding interactive fun lessons in which high school youth learn and experience what it's like to be a lawyer. But of course, this isn't a normal year. And so this year, we're going to be showing you how you can do the legal diversity pipeline program in a virtual format while this public health pandemic is going on. 
but we are looking forward to the day that we can return to those in-person programs again because what we found from from the surveys and discussions with youth and discussions with the, the people who participate in the program is that face-to-face -face contact is often one of the most meaningful parts of the program not just for the high schoolers, not just for the young people, but also for the legal profession, professionals who are teaching the program as well. So we're looking forward to the day we can go back to in-person programming. But this year we know that uh, virtual program is, is what's possible. And so we've we, we geared our program to allow for that. And a little bit later, Erica and Joy are going to talk to you more about that. I'd also like to say a few words about street law overall, because I know some of you may not be familiar with some of the other things we do. So you can see, you know, our mission is to educate young people, communities about the law so that they have the civic knowledge, the legal knowledge to make positive change. And we do that in several ways. We do that primarily through interactive lessons. In fact, if we were in a street law lesson right now, we might be doing something called a mind walk. And in that mind walk, I'd ask someone to volunteer to describe to the class just what their typical day is like from the moment they wake up in the morning until the moment they go to sleep. And then I would ask the other classmates to stop them every time they said something that in some way interacted with the law. And what we would find is that very quickly, you can't even leave the house without interacting with the law in several ways. The water that you use to brush your teeth or make your coffee is regulated by the law. The house or the apartment that you live in, the building codes govern the way in which that was constructed. And of course, if you do leave the house, which I know not all of us are doing these days, but the law is governing the, the traffic regulations that you follow as you drive your car or ride your bike or across the street. Even the air that we breathe is affected by the law. So you can see how important it is for the law to be something that's accessible and understandable, not just for lawyers, not just for policymakers, but for everyday people. And that's the, the premise that street law was founded upon almost 50 years ago. Now, over those 50 years, we've grown from a program that started at Georgetown University Law School and Washington, D.C. schools to one that stretches across the United States and around the world. In fact, we've worked in 45 countries since we were founded. And the way in which we do these programs, in addition to the, the Legal Diversity Pipeline program that you'll learn more about today, but we also do a number of teacher professional development programs. Uh, we write textbooks, uh, street law, a uh, high school legal textbook is now it's in, tenth, in, in its 10th edition. We also have a government textbook. And for those of you on this uh, session who are teachers, I'd also encourage you to go to our website. We have a number of free resources that you can download and use to teach about the law and the courts and uh, controversial issues. Another program that we have is a, uh, our Legal Life Skills program. And Legal Life Skills really gives people a very practical understanding of those everyday legal skills you need in order to rent an apartment, get a job, uh, interact with the police, as well as financial literacy skills and other, other essential life skills. We do that program in, with a number of different community organizations. Uh, so for example, organizations that are working with youth that are aging out of the foster care system or people that have been the victims of domestic violence or human trafficking. And that's another program where we also partner with corporations and firms in order to bring those lessons to those communities. And then finally, our international programs work in a number of different countries with civic educators, with law schools, with legal professionals to do actually much of the same work that we do in the U.S., helping law schools start up these, these interactive street law programs, working with community organizations to educate people about the law. Right now, for example, we're partnering with a, a major firm in Bulgaria as well as a local civic education group to connect legal professionals in Bulgaria to go into classrooms, much as we do in the United States. We're also working with community organizations in Jordan to educate youth about the law. 
and we're working with Tashkent State University of Law in Uzbekistan so that they can start up their own street law program and Uzbek law students can go into high schools and teach about Uzbek law. So that's a little bit of an overview about some of the other programs that street law does. And if you'd like to know more about any of these, or if you'd like to know how you or your organization can become involved, please feel free to contact us and we'd love to tell you more about it. Now back to the pipeline program. The pipeline program at its core wants to do these four things. We want to teach people about the law and what it's like to be a lawyer. We want to encourage them to think about the law as a possible profession for themselves. We want to instill in them the belief and the confidence that they can succeed in the law or in their other professions that they go into. And we want to create these positive connections between high school youth and acting legal professionals. So one last chat request before I pass this on to Erica. This is a, a very different year coming up. So please, in, in one word, just tell us what are your feelings about this upcoming school year? So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Erica Wang. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Erica Wang. I am the program manager at Street Law and um, I work with lots of programs, but specifically for the Legal Diversity Pipeline program, um, I work on collecting and analyzing um, the data for our programs and communicating with you all to get you the materials you need and just check in on how your program is doing. So I'm just going to be sharing a slide that kind of touches on some of the resources that we have. So let me just get it started. Um, so the first thing we love for everyone to do is to keep in touch with us. Um, I've created a form called the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program Check-In Form. Um, so what this form is, is essentially a jot form that asks you questions I might normally ask you over a phone call or an email. Um, and it just asks you about your program site, um, how your relationship with your partner teacher is, um, maybe about how your um, students are, your student feedback forms if you have them, um, how many students and volunteers you reached, what topics you taught, and so on and so forth. So all of those questions are easily filled out um, through this check-in form and you can always request um, to keep in touch with me and Joy otherwise throughout this form as well. Um, so like I said, the data we mainly need from you is um, the number of students impacted, the number of volunteers who participated in the program, what topics um, you taught, the date of your Legal Careers Conference. And so the Legal Careers Conference, for some of you who may not know, is the kind of culminating event for the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program. Traditionally, during a year where there is not a pandemic going on, um, there are a set of classroom visits followed by the culminating event, which is Legal Careers Conference. And um, this year, it would be a little, it would look a little bit different, but usually it's the one that um, kind of gives the students an opportunity to go, to go on campus and see the site or the firm. And we also need the student and teacher reflection forms. We really like to see what the students and what the teachers are thinking. Um, and we're always happy to analyze the data from those forms for you. So you'll have these slides after this webinar. And you can email Joy at this email or me at this email for program updates and assistance at any time. So the Pipeline eLibrary is something that is really, really helpful. Some of you may know it, some of you may not. It's been updated and it's still getting updated frequently. So the Pipeline eLibrary is our virtual database of pipeline lessons and activities and anything administrative you can think of. This is going to include our new virtual materials for online programming. And so as soon as you have an access to the Pipeline eLibrary through an account, you can access all of our virtual lessons, materials, planning templates, and enhancements. Um, who can access the Pipeline eLibrary? So 
anyone who is in any way connected to Pipeline, either as a program volunteer, a site leader, a partner teacher, you guys can all access the Pipeline Library. And it's located on our website at streetlaw.org. You can refer to this slide when you go and look for it, but basically you hover your cursor in the right-hand corner and it's right there in the resources drop-down menu. So to register for a Pipeline eLibrary, you just have to fill out this form right here. All it requires is your name, email, organization, and city and title. And once you fill out that form, I'm able to create an account for you that will be ready within a few business days. You can send up your entire team by sending me an email with all of the names and email addresses of your team. And then with that, I can create accounts for all of you and send it right over to your team leader. If you need a new password, just send me an email and I'll create you a new password. And then we have student reflection forms that can also be filled out here on this JOT form, or they can be found in the planning and administration section of the Pipeline eLibrary. So the reflection forms that are filled out here are a little bit different in the sense that they are templates. They're not specific to any site. So if you do need a specific template or a specific form made for your site, then I can always make you a reflection form that's more specific to what the topics you guys are learning are. Um, and as, like I said, we're happy to analyze the data and feedback from the students. Teacher reflection forms as well. Uh, we love to hear what the teachers are finding the program to be. Um, and they can fill out their reflection forms here. It has all of the same questions as the reflection form you can find in the Pipeline eLibrary. And just as a reminder, these are our emails. Refer to this slide whenever you need to. It has all of the links you need, and you can always email us if you have any questions. And I think I'm gonna just turn it over to Joy now. Thank you so much, Erica. Well, welcome everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here online with us. As my colleagues have already mentioned, we are covering quite a bit of information today. So when uh, a couple days from now, when you do receive the recording uh, for this webinar and you receive the slides, you'll have an opportunity to go back and review many of the items that we have talked about. First and foremost, I would love to ask you what you enjoy most about the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program. Some of you have already implement, implemented. Um, for those of you who are uh, about to or considering doing so, please choose from, from the selections about what it is that attracts you to the program. Perfect. So for, for many of you, uh, the, lead, the lead choice seems to be encouraging youth, but it is closely followed by giving back, to the, giving back to the community and fostering diversity in the legal profession. Here at Street Law, we are enthusiastic about all of these things, and so we're really happy to see that, that that's how you are feeling and how you feel connected to the program. So let's do a quick review of the program components. Um, as, we, as we've mentioned, this year is a little bit different, but thinking about pre-pandemic times, uh, the main program components for the Legal Diversity Pipeline Program are our classroom visits, followed by um, companion workshops, which helps students not only explore what's been introduced to them through the classroom visits, but also gives them an opportunity 
to engage in legal simulations so they can step into the shoes of legal professionals for the day and make many of the, the same decisions and apply many, many of the same skills that all of you do on a daily basis. And last but not least, there is the career exploration component where students have an opportunity to ask more in-depth questions of the volunteers and have an opportunity to talk about the pathways that are possible for them in leading them to and through the career. So let's take this opportunity to ask you what your programs look like specifically. If you're already implementing the program, please respond to this poll. Great, so first let me acknowledge those of you who have not yet implemented. We know that a number of you were planning to implement programs in the spring and were disrupted by the pandemic. We're so pleased not only to have you join us for this webinar, but to have you rejoin the effort this semester. And we're continuing, and we look forward to continuing our work with you. And some of you are considering impl implementing and have not yet joined us, but we deeply appreciate your interest. The vast majority of you are including classroom visits, workshops, and a career component, and that's exactly what we love to hear. This is an opportunity for those of you who may not be doing that to go back and revisit this model. If you need any support from us moving forward um, on this, by, by all means, feel free to reach out. So now that we are making the transition onto, uh, into online learning, um, many of you are curious about what it takes to, to create a, the type of create, um, inclusive learning environment that you are accustomed to doing in person. First and foremost, if you are a voluntary site leader, by all means, engage your, your partner teacher in this conversation. They can share all sorts of insights about the students that they are meeting this year, what their needs are, what their passions are, what really gets them excited and engaged. And all of us can spend a lot more time getting to know students. We know that it's a little bit more difficult when we're doing this online, but we do have some suggestions for you. Icebreakers are always a great way to get things started. Um, when you have a chance to look at the virtual materials that are available to you, we have some suggestions for, for how you can break the ice on, online. If you have some of your own that you would like to use, by all means, use those. And, and don't underestimate the power of your introductions. They are more, more important than you may realize. It's not just a question of sharing your name and your title, but it's your opportunity to set a positive tone, to explain what it is you do in plain language, especially since some students don't understand all the, the legal jargon that you will be using. And it lets, you, it lets the students know how excited you are to be participating. Uh, for those of you who are in a, in a position and feel comfortable with technology, you can certainly use a video to introduce your, yourselves to students um, in advance of your official virtual visits. Um, and also, this is a great opportunity for, for leaders within your organizations to become involved. We know that they have very busy schedules, but since there won't be travel involved, it is possible to invite leaders to speak with students for the first few minutes of a session or or join them for the end of a session and to offer words of encouragement. Now more than ever, diversity and inclusion are important, especially when it comes to classroom learning. And so there are four main principles that we want each and every participant to keep in mind. First and foremost, every single person who is participating is worthy of, of respect. Also, every student that you meet is a capable learner. So during times like these when there's so much going on, please understand that we want to keep our expectations high and support students in, in the ways that are meaningful for them. Students' lived experiences, even when they're different from ours, are highly valuable. 
So please be open-minded about that. And last but not least, differences of opinion are essential for creating meaningful dialogue in a classroom. Let's focus a little bit on social emotional awareness. The educators on this call will certainly be familiar with, with many of these concepts, but those of you who are not in the education space should, should be aware of some of these basic principles. During these times, all of us have experienced a great deal of change and upheaval, and for students specifically, some may be experiencing a sense of uncertainty, or there may be disruptions to the routines that they are accustomed, accustomed with. Also due to the pandemic, natural disasters, ongoing racial injustice, and some of the daily responsibilities for which students are responsible, um, there may be some additional impacts that they're feeling during these times. Last but not least, there are students that even in 2020 have inadequate access to, to uh, suitable digital devices and internet access. So please be sensitive about that when you're, when you're planning your, your programs. During these times especially, there are a number of, of researchers who have who shared what it is important for us to focus on when we are, are in, an, in a learning environment. Um, one piece of, of research that, that's come to the fore recently um, focuses on what it is students need during times of crisis. More than anything, they need to feel a sense of connectedness. They need to understand that there are regular routines and structures in place. They also need to understand that, that what they're concerned about um, and when things change, those things can be dis discussed during the moment. So you may find students um, you know, curious and interested in, in talking about um, um, the activities of, of the day, of current, about uh, current events. This is actually a great opportunity to be flexible in your conversations with them. Last but not least, we always want to focus on empowerment. For street law in particular, Empowering partic participants in our programs is essential to their learning. That's why we try to make students the center of our experience, um, the center of the learning experience, and we also want them to feel responsible for their own learning with, with support and guidance from volunteers. While online etiquette may seem, um, seem like something that, that's easy to take for granted, these ideas they seem straightforward, but if you are, are in a position to implement them, they can make your program flow much more smoothly. So it's pretty obvious that all of us should be displaying civility at all times, but something that legal volunteers should be especially aware of is that your partner teacher has probably already established some classroom norms, and you should make every effort to become familiar with those and to try to, try to be in line with those so that students know that you are a part of their classrooms. We also want to try to eliminate distractions whenever possible and set things up so that only one person is speaking at, at a time. It's a little bit more difficult to do this online, but when we meet our microphones and we're not speaking, encourage others to do the same, it makes it a little bit easier. Also to, to remember is that online communication does not necessarily enjoy the same benefits of, of people being able to read each other's social cues and looking at each other's body language. And so if there are times when students don't seem to be grasping a concept or they seem to be misunderstanding what someone is saying, always take time to go back and address that, try to clarify and explain in a different way. It's not necessarily you. It could be the fact that you're communicating online and it, it's just interpreting a little bit different than it might in person. So many of you have asked us, you know, how will the virtual materials that are now available in the e-library e specifically um, marked uh, under a virtual tab, you know, how are these going to be different? Well, first and for foremost, you may notice that um, something about the formatting. The formatting will look very familiar to you in terms of what a street law lesson looks like. Um, the lessons we've written in a way that are um, easy to transfer to multiple learning platforms. So whatever it is you may be using, it will be easy for you to follow along and, and go through those steps in their, in their correct order, regardless of what, what sort of learning platform you may be learning. Um, the content is, is the same, 
but the methods of delivering the information is somewhat different since we don't have the benefit of being together in the same place. There are some cases where, you, where you'll find some additional visual materials that will enhance the online learning. We encourage you to take a look through those and, and use those as you implement the actual lessons. The one thing that has not changed is that there is still the expectation that students are going to interact with each other and with the legal volunteers, and that legal volunteers should be playing the role of facilitators, especially when, it, um, especially when students are engaging in small group conversations. So how is this actually going to look? For those of you who, who have already implemented, here's what it's going to look like when you, when you get um, into your virtual classroom lessons. One thing uh, that, that will be of comfort to you is that our typical in-person classroom lessons are about 50 minutes long. And the same is true of the virtual classroom lessons. So in terms of timing, there is not much that you will need to change there. There is a slight difference, however, when it comes to what workshops will look like. In the past, in-person workshops have lasted approximately 70 minutes, but in the virtual environment, what we found was that it's very difficult to do the same amount of work simultaneously within a 70-minute period. Therefore, we have written virtual workshops in two parts, and each of those two parts is approximately 45 to 50 minutes. This is something very important for you to keep in mind when setting up a timeline for your program because you will need to establish um, two, separate, two separate sessions or classroom visits during which time you will implement the workshops. Part one will look mostly like, um, like preparation and getting a full understanding and overview of what's ex expected for students. And then the second part will focus mostly on reviewing major concepts and having students look at their strategies and plans and then engaging in the legal simulations. So there are some sites we know that are very large. You're, you are accustomed to handling three or four or five topics during, um, during your, your workshop ses sessions. If time is a, if, is a factor, you may want to consider scaling back and perhaps um, offering fewer workshops, but, but allowing students the adequate time to do them over two parts. And last but not least, the all-important career activity does remain a part of the program during these times. Many of you in person were implementing the types of activities that are listed here, and we have established virtual components which, which um, take the place. So, um, those of you who were, who were accustomed to doing some sort of networking and talking about career pathways during lunch can do the same thing online. We've, we're calling it now Talk with a Professional. There's still a way to exchange business cards. But we're just going to do it in a virtual environment. And last but not least, many of you um, um, participate in the career fair. This is something that typically gets high marks from the students and we have figured out a way for you to do this virtually. So again, when you take a look through the e-library and look specifically under the, the tab um, for, for classroom materials and learning materials, you will see um, career activities that are, that are set up for you. Those will take about the same amount of time that they take when you are in person. The biggest question by far that we is, have received is, will there be a legal careers conference or a law day to end the program? We know how much many of you look forward to this day, how much time and energy you put into planning the day, and it's certainly a highlight for most students. Unfortunately, due to the confines of being online, it's going to be very difficult to carry out what is typically a four to six hour event. So the approach that we are recommending is that sites in the program with the career activity now in the virtual space and create time for student recognition. We understand that it's not quite the same as being in person, but it is powerful in the sense that students have an opportunity to reflect on all that they've learned, on the skills they've had an opportunity to, to use, and also it's a great time to, to recognize their growth since since they from the beginning of the program to where they are 
at the end of the program. You'll find listed here some suggestions for how you can make this virtual capstone experience happen. You may not have an opportunity to implement all of these, but implementing one or two can make a huge difference in what your virtual capstone experience looks like. By all means, invite an interesting and engaging closing speaker, someone from your, your organization or someone from the local legal community um, can, can be a really, really great component to add because that person can energize students, help them feel inspired, and help them continue to look forward to expanding their skills and researching more and understanding more so that they will hopefully enter the legal profession. Um, the, instead of printing out the certificates of completion, which so many of you do at your sites, you can still create the certificates for students and send them out virtually using your partner teacher's help. Um, also, there are all sorts of, of special things that you can do online if you, have, if you have the comfort and the time to do them. You can make things um, look really special to students online. You can, um, you can list the, the logos of your, your respective organizations. You can add music, you can add visual effects. All these things will help students get into a celebratory mood and it will create an opportunity for you to celebrate their accomplishments. So another question that we received quite a bit was, which online platform should we use? The simple answer is you should use the learning platform, which is approved by your partner, school, partner school's district. Um, if, if you do have access to more than one and you feel comfortable using more than one, you certainly can, but there is nothing wrong with streamlining and using the platform, which helps you accomplish most of what it is you're trying to do. For, for those of, of for those sites where there is a partner teacher who is especially tech savvy and that person feels comfortable navigating multiple platforms, um, you're certainly welcome to use more than one, but keeping it simple is, is always the best policy. Again, we've simplified the lessons, so whatever the learning platform is, you should be able to implement the lessons and follow the steps just as you always have. In anticipation of the fact that there are just some things that are beyond our control when it comes to technology. While you're setting up your timeline and, and looking at dates, you may want to set up a backup date just in case a pre-scheduled activity is disrupted. We certainly hope that no one would lose power or that a server would go down, but if that does happen, you already have that backup date on your calendars and that will give you peace of mind if you need to regroup and implement that particular portion at a different time. So another question we received is, is it okay to record the program? If you are a partner teacher, you may record any part of the program so long as you're using it for educational purposes and you will follow your district's policies re regarding recording. I, I know this is especially important to many of the educators who are um, teaching in a hybrid format this year, meaning that there are some days when they see students in person and other days when they are, are connecting with students remotely. So by all means, go ahead and follow your district's policies and you can share recordings of the program. If you are a legal volunteer, you may record so long as you have the school's permission and signed photographic releases are on file for all of the students in the virtual classroom. This is similar to what we require for in-person programming. If you need to find a, a template for what that photographic release looks like, you can always visit the Planning and Administration tab in the e-library. Many of you have those photographic releases already. So if that's something that you intend to do because you want to share a screenshot, for example, in your upcoming newsletter, or you want to, to share a, a, a snippet from a video, um, to show other people at your organization or within the legal community uh, the types of work you're doing with students, that's fine, but you do have to have that permission first. So the moment that most of you have been waiting for, which virtual materials are actually in the Pipeline e-library? As I mentioned, um, when, you, when you visit the library, you will see clearly marked that there is a virtual tab within the, the uh, classroom lessons section 
And these six topics are available both in the introductory classroom um, lessons and also in the companion workshops. You will find materials for advertising, contracts, cyberbullying, new materials on environmental law, which we are also very excited about, Fourth Amendment, and sexual harassment. We have found that these are uh, commonly requested items. These are very engaging for students. They often rate these topics very highly, give them high, high marks, and many of, you, many of you who have volunteered in the past have accessed these topics. You may be wondering, if your preferred topics are not available and you are accustomed to implementing other topics, what should you do? Well, first and foremost, obviously this is a year unlike any other. So that this may be a time to consider trying something new. We know that we, you, you love doing what you do with the pipeline program and we're grateful for that. But, but this may be a time to consider whether some of the topics that are available in the, for, in the virtual format may, may be a better choice. If after talking with your team and your partner teacher, you decide that you would still like to, um, to implement some of the other topics, then we encourage you to brainstorm some different ways to communicate the same information. As I mentioned, the content is the same, it's the delivery method, which is different. Work together with your partner teacher. Uh, just be sensitive to the fact that many educators during these times are taking on additional responsibilities um, due to the pandemic. So, be sensitive to your teacher, teacher's schedule. If you decide to move forward with, with other materials and implement, and implement different topics, be sure that you're building in transition time between the components and make sure you ask students their opinion, get some feedback afterwards. If you're having an especially uh, um, successful experience with somewhat with, with uh, teaching topics that are not included in the virtual materials, by all means, get in touch with us and let us know about your successes. We always want to be able to share those best practices with the wider pipeline community. So do let us know. So here are some tips for teaching effectively. By all means, communication is everything. When you look at the virtual materials that are available to you, be sure you're looking at that before teaching section, which is near the top of, of each lesson or workshop, so you know what's expected of you before the actual virtual visit happens. Also, volunteers should keep in mind that it's students who should be doing most of the talking. Volunteers are there to serve as coaches, as guides, and to support students in their own learning. There will be times when you need to use legal jargon. If you have to, make sure that you define it clearly in plain language so that students understand the meaning in this specific context. Also, make sure that you're checking for understanding before moving on to the, the next section of a lesson. So anytime new content comes up, or you're explaining things to a large group and then you're going to have students move into smaller groups and make sure that that students understand what it is that you mean. This can be as simple as asking students to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down indicating that they understand something or what some some folks in the, the community uh, in the education community call um, fist to five meaning if, if students show a fist it means they don't have very much understanding and if they show all five fingers they have a pretty clear understanding of what it is you're asking them to do. Last but not least, online teaching and learning are different than when they happen in person. So please be patient with yourselves, be patient with your teammates, and be, be patient with the students. The learning will happen, it just looks a little bit different. A few, few tips, a few more tips that we will leave you with is as you do with your in-person programs, always offer constructive criticism and genuine praise. Remember that this is an opportunity for students to learn new skills or to enhance those that they already have. And so hearing from you about what it is they're doing well or what they need to improve is essential to their learning. Also, for those of you who are fortunate enough to be at schools where there is an extended period or a block period available, there is a tendency to want to add additional material or components because you have more time. 
if you choose to do that, make sure that you take a break about every 45 minutes. As attuned as students are to technology, they are still human and all of us need a little bit extra time to process information when we're learning it online. So use that 45 minutes as a guide and be sure to offer everybody a break and then reconvene and move to another component if time allows you to do that. There's nothing wrong with saying that you don't know the answer to a question. Please volunteer to, to take time and do a little bit of research and come back and reconnect with students if you don't know the answer. I, I know many of us in the legal profession are reluctant to do this, but remember that you're also showing students that it's okay to ask for help. And if we don't know something, we still have the power to find the answer together. And last but not least, during these times of, of, of being online and doing business this way and learning this way, there will just be situations where things don't go quite as planned. You know what, if your pet runs through the living room while you were trying to, to share with students what probable cause is all about, that's how life is sometimes. Just have a sense of humor about it, be kind and move on whenever you're ready. So let's talk about creating connections. We know that it can be a little bit more difficult when we're online um, in creating those, especially when we're, we're getting acquainted with someone. But there are some things that we can do actively to try to help that. We've already mentioned the idea of, of having uh, brief remarks from leaders in your organizations and icebreakers, but this is a really important time to make sure that you listen to students and encourage them. And we, we strongly recommend that legal volunteers follow up with their partner teachers, including during times when you're not implementing the program. So for example, if you always implement a fall program, nothing should stop you from reaching out during the spring semester, just asking the student how they are doing and how their students are doing. For those of you who implement in the spring, we are thrilled that, that many of you have joined this call today you can do exactly the same now. You don't have to wait until the spring semester when you implement to talk with your partner teacher and to inquire about students and what's going on at school. Ask, ask now, get in touch, and start, start the communication and the planning now. Right, and a few other ways to, uh, to connect. We always encourage legal volunteers if they feel comfortable to share their professional email address or to, or to um, offer invitations on LinkedIn for meeting students, we do not recommend other forms of social media since students tend to use those much more casually and we want to keep this professional. Uh, we've talked about sending virtual cert uh, certificates of completion. Um, if you happen to be in a position where you're in a hybrid program, and the school does allow items to be sent to the school, you can check in advance with your partner teacher and see if it would be appropriate to send something such as snacks or gift cards. This is entirely up to you, but please do make sure that you do that first if you are, if you are paired with a school where hybrid learning is going on. Last but not least, we always encourage legal volunteers not only to keep in touch during the semester when they are not implementing the program, but see if they can serve as a resource. See if you can be a, a, a partner with your, your partner teacher sometimes, um, if they are teaching other law related material and perhaps um, want a little bit of guidance on that or would want you to talk with students for a few minutes so, so students can see how the law is applied in a real world environment. Let's touch a little bit on enhancements. For those of you who are continuing experience sites, we know that a number of you have enhancement activities already in place. And some of you who have been implementing for some time want to use this, this upcoming school year to provide in program enhancements to participating students. Again, program enhancements are are typically for the most excited, enthusiastic students. They are follow-up activities that are above and beyond um, the model of the, of the pipeline program to help students strengthen their focus and their skills as they consider entering the legal profession. We do offer some guidance on how you could do some of these activities virtually. 
So some of you have in the past have offered um, support for writing resumes or informational interviews. Some of you have even uh, partnered with your schools to offer things such as college tours. Some of those things actually can happen virtually with some advanced planning. So we offer guidance around virtual enhancements and you will find those again in the e-library under the virtual tab. So many of you are quite ambitious and you've already asked us, if we're already, impl if we're already implementing the program and including all the components that are required, can we do more? You certainly can and we encourage you to do that. If you have the time and the creativity and the resources to make it happen, you're certainly welcome to add additional components to your program. All we ask is that you, you make sure that you are, are in communication with your partner, school, and teacher to make sure that there is, is ample time to do this without interfering in instructional time. Also, any components that you add, we encourage you to be brief and relevant and make sure that those components are, are not more than 45 minutes unless you are in a position to take that, that break that all of us need and then reset in, and resume with the rest of the activity. And as always, whether you're in person or online, we never want you to lecture to students or engage in something such as an extended panel discussion. We want any activities that you are, are working through with students to remain interactive. So as the song says, someday we will be together. Jennifer at, at the beginning of this, this webinar indicated that you know, we are in difficult times right now and, and there is the need for virtual programming. But also the expectation is once this pandemic is behind us, we will come together once again in person. We'll have an opportunity to shake hands again. We'll have an opportunity to see each other's smiles. We'll have an opportunity to sit side by side and learn and grow and collaborate together. So we certainly look forward to that time. We appreciate your commitment to this program, your commitment to reaching out to young people in your local communities we look forward to the time when we can be together in person once again. We presented a lot of information for you, so you probably have some, some questions that you've been wanting to ask. We would love to hear what's on your mind. We would also love to hear from those of you who have some ideas that you think may be helpful for others in the pipeline community to know about. We'd be happy to um, answer any additional questions you have. You're welcome to type them in the chat box. Great, so I am seeing some comments right now. Um, we, do, we do look forward to, to continuing this conversation with all of you. Um, many of you have already checked in with us. You have something on the calendar with us um, to check in. Great, so please continue to add your questions to the chat box and Erica and I would be happy to uh, take a look at those and to field your questions. Erica, we do have a couple questions popping up into the chat box. So when you have an opportunity to scroll through them, please go ahead and read those out loud so everybody can hear them. And then you and I can do our best to respond. Um, so there's a question from Tina, um, which is, do you have suggestions for shorter time commitment? We usually do two classroom visits and an office visit with the students. OK. 
Okay, terrific. Great. So, so Tina, it sounds like um, you had a, a pretty efficient model that you were implementing before. If you are able to keep that that timing about the same, that's perfectly fine. If you if you do find that you're you're time pressed and there, there's not enough uh, mutually agreeable time when you talk with your partner teacher, one possibility is to um, agree upon which which topic you are going to visit. Um, take a look at those materials along with your partner teacher and your volunteer team. And if, if possible, your partner teacher could teach some of the concepts on his or her own first during an already scheduled class and then have, um, have the legal volunteers join for, for the agreed upon time when you all want to have your virtual classroom visit. So students will already have had some background in, in um, and what it is that you're going to explore with them. And then um, the, same, the same can happen with the virtual workshops where since part one is going to focus on preparation for a legal simulation, if it's possible for the students to do um, the preparation as part of a regularly scheduled class, and that's led by the teacher, then you all can, um, as volunteers, then come together with them online and carry out the simulation because they, are, they will have already done some of the preparation. So that's one thing to consider. Um, but, but however you decide to organize your time, please make sure that you, you do have the, the career com component in place, which, um, which in this case would be part of your virtual capstone experience and you take time to recognize students. So I, I hope that, that that advice is helpful to you. Um, Joy, we have another question from Josephine Chang. Um, she said, usually our workshop can have 60 or 70 kids. Uh, do you have any tips on doing this virtually with such a big group? Yes, so that is, that is a very large number. And, and, and thank you for that question, Josephine. We know that a number of you have very large programs. This is where I think talking with your, your partner teacher or partner teachers, if you have more than one, is, is very important. It may be useful in this case to actually assign students in advance to workshops or to have um, two go on simultaneously online. So what it could look like is if you typically have 70 students, it could be that 35 students are assigned to group A and 35 students are assigned to group B and that the volunteers split them themselves in half and then offer the guidance to go through the workshop just as they would when you were all together in person um, because 70, 70 is quite a, quite a bit to, impl to implement and to manage on, online. Um, however you decide to approach it, um, the, team, the team approach goes a very long way here. Um, instead of just, you know, where you may, might, may have had typically, you know, two or three or four people work on a workshop, this would be a time to make sure that there are, are more volunteers than that in place, um, simply because you have such large numbers. So that question was actually from Deja Haley. It somehow is showing up as Deja Haley. <laughs> okay, from Deja. Well, thank you for your question, Deja. I'm sure many other large sites are wondering about that as well. And Erica, do we have any other questions? Um, seeing any other questions. I did see that um, Joseph Klein, it's not a question really, but he said, I'd love a way to share PowerPoints or other stuff building on the programs. So that might be something open-ended. Um, oh. Vicki Taylor, Ms. Vicki Taylor asked, do I need to contact Ms. Pam to arrange my school's virtual tour? Okay, so, so, um, so hi, Mrs. Taylor, glad that you could, could join us. Um, please go ahead and, and reach out to Pam, your, your um, site coordinator, um, whenever you're ready. You know, this is definitely a two-way street. We hope that coordinators will reach out to teachers and teachers will reach out to coordinators. You all can figure out the timing that's right for you to get things started. 
And, um, and to all of you, you know, once you have an opportunity to think about the materials that were presented today, you have an opportunity to talk as a team, uh, to include your partner teachers in the conversation and do some planning, um, you know, always feel that you can come back and ask us, ask us follow-up questions if things just aren't clear or if you need some ideas about how to, how to keep the momentum going and how to, how to implement. All right, if there are no more questions at this time, then we would like to ask a question of all of you. Now that you know more about the tools and materials available, how confident are you about program implementation? Okay, we have a few moments for people to log their responses. Right now, most, most of you are in, are moder uh, moderately com confident or higher. Looks like very confident is where most people are. You're feeling good about this. Um, most of you are at least feeling okay. This is wonderful. And for those of you who are feeling less confident, at the moment. Uh, we do encourage you to take some time, look at the virtual materials that are available. Feel free to go back and reference the slides when you receive them. And if you continue to have questions and concerns, please do not hesitate to get in contact with me or with Erica. We want you to feel comfortable. We are so happy that you have made this commitment to continue this work with us. It's true that these are times like we have not seen before, but we know that you can be successful and we are grateful for your support. Again, here's my information in case you missed it earlier. You're welcome to send me an email or give me a call. And last but not least, please follow Street Law on social media. This is our tag for social media. We know that many of you like to um, share good news about your programs. We would love to see uh, photographs if you have them, or we would love to, to hear um, quotes from students and from volunteers and from teachers. Let us know how things are going so all of us as a community can keep in, in touch and find out what's happening at other sites. Once again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this webinar. We look forward to being in touch with you, hearing the great news, and we wish you a safe and happy rest of the day. Thank you for joining us.